Being a gunner on a bomber is not a great job. A famous saying of the era is, gunner today, goner tomorrow. There are many heroes in World War II. One such man is a tail gunner, and then a resistance fighter named Charlie Warren. By the night of January 23rd, 1944, Charlie has already flown a number of missions and is now a young veteran, but this night will be different. As Charlie recounts, he has an unusual dream in which God tells him he will face trouble the next day. He's not a man of faith, so he thinks the dream is rather strange. Nevertheless, the next day he tells his crewmates about his dream and tells them to be extra alert on the day's mission. He flies with the 335th Squadron, U.S. Army Air Force. Charlie knows the mission to bomb the rail yard at Ochown will be tough, as their briefing map indicates their B-17, named the Roaring Bill, will be flying over heavy anti-aircraft fire. Sure enough, as the bomber crew prepares to drop their payload of bombs, they're hit by heavy flak and the engines begin to smoke. The pilot finds an open field to drop his payload and turns for home. Charlie wonders, is this the moment his dream was warning about? Suddenly, a Messerschmitt or German fighter plane sees the sputtering B-17 somewhere over Brussels and launches a 20 millimeter shell which strikes the cockpit, wounding the captain and several crew members. The wounded captain orders the men to bail. As Charlie prepares for his jump, he realizes a piece of shrapnel is lodged in his parachute. He quickly pulls the metal fragment out. Then he kicks the escape door, but nothing happens. He kicks it two more times before it grudgingly opens. Awkwardly, he squeezes through the hatch and jumps from the burning plane. All the men make it out alive, except for the captain, who sacrifices his life by staying at the controls so the plane can remain steady as his crew jumps to safety. As Charlie descends to the ground, he realizes only one cord is attached to his chute and that the shrapnel has created multiple holes in his chute. He struggles to attach his second cord and then braces himself for impact. Charlie crashes into a tree, tangles, and then falls headfirst to the ground. He's about 20 miles from Brussels. Suddenly and unexpectedly, two French teenage girls rush forward and help him unhook from his harness. Then they motion to him to follow them to a nearby home where the lady of the home, Madame Fauconnier, gives Charlie one of her husband's suits and burns his uniform and identification papers. Charlie's quite worried now, as the suit is made for a much shorter man, and with his identification cards burned and Madame Fauconnier holding onto his dog tags, he fears that if the Germans capture him, he'll be shot as a spy. Later in the day, Madame Fauconnier directs Charlie to a nearby church where he meets August Lapointe, a member of the Belgian resistance. He is a truck driver and is carrying large rolls of paper on his truck bed. He orders Charlie to hide in the center of one of these large spools of paper, and then he covers all the spools with a tarp. Shortly after they start down the road, they are forced to stop at a German checkpoint. One of the guards promptly jumps up on the truck bed and begins to drive his bayonet down through the center of each of these spools. Charlie nervously listens as he gets closer and closer. At length, the soldier arrives at the spool where Charlie is hiding and drives his bayonet down through the center of the spool, just narrowly missing Charlie's head. At this point, the driver begins to yell that he will be fired if he does not get the rolls of newsprint to their destination soon. Amazingly, the German stops searching the truck and let Charlie and his accomplice go. From Lapointe's home, Charlie is taken to a tavern to wait for his next destination. To avoid having any of the patrons speak to him, Charlie pretends he's occupied reading. The plan seems to be working, but the arrival of several German soldiers begins to make Charlie jumpy. It is at this moment, the tavern keeper's wife, who knows Charlie as a downed American soldier, comes over to his table and begins to refill his glass while casually flipping his book right side up. To his relief, Charlie is finally able to leave the tavern. Lapointe then takes him to a store where he's provided with new identification papers by the resistance. As he leaves the store, Charlie accidentally bumps into a group of women wearing German uniforms and absentmindedly says, excuse me, in English. Realizing his grave mistake, he and Lapointe sprint down the street, away from the shocked Germans, and leap onto a slow-moving tram, making their escape. From there, Charlie travels to Brussels, where the resistance offers him a rather startling proposition. The Belgian underground has learned that Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, arguably Germany's greatest general and the commander designated to stop the possible Allied invasion of Western Europe, will shortly be driving by Charlie's apartment. Shockingly, they ask Charlie to assassinate Rommel. 
Charlie declines. He knows the only weapon he has is a Saturday night special, which is a junk gun purchased on the streets of the city and is neither highly reliable nor highly accurate. Charlie rightfully sees the request as a suicide mission with little hope for success. Consequently, he passes on an opportunity to radically alter the outcome of the war, or as he sees it, to simply die a senseless death. Eventually, Charlie joins Ed Dutroux, the Belgian underground second in command. He is now part of the resistance. Charlie's main job is signaling the Royal Air Force using a flashlight and Morse code, telling them where to drop guns, ammunition, and gear for the Belgian resistance fighters. When D-Day, or the Allied invasion of Western Europe, finally arrives, Charlie signals Allied planes, helping guide them to their intended drop zones. He also helps the Belgian underground create a series of diversions against German occupiers. Eventually, with the arrival of Allied troops, Charlie can return home. Amazingly, Charlie isn't finished. Upon returning to the States, he quickly re-enlists in the Army and actively serves in the Berlin airlift crisis. While on active duty, he has the opportunity to return to Belgium and visit the former members of the underground. He gives them a commemorative plaque to show his gratitude for their help. In return, the Belgians give Charlie his missing dog tags, a piece of the parachute recovered from his jump, and a picture of the tree he landed in. Most special to Charlie is a gift from the head of the Belgian resistance, who hands him a personally hand-carved pipe to thank him for helping the underground. However, Charlie's not done being a hero. Years later, his lovely bride, falls ill to the dreadful scourge of Alzheimer's. Charlie dedicates the next decade to caring for her. At the age of 93, the humble resistance fighter passes away. In the end, Charlie learned from his dream, always be alert, something he did, spending a lifetime being alert to the needs of others.